Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is this okay? This, you can hear me. Yeah. I'm uh, Betty Yao, co-curator of the John Thompson exhibition currently over at the Brunei Gallery with Narissa Chakabong here. And um, thank you so much for coming this evening. Uh, this is the last of the two lectures, although we have a couple of gallery tours still going on. And we're closing the exhibition last day is 23rd of June. Um, when I embarked on the John Thompson project, the exhibition project, over 10 years ago, my go-to reference, as it were, my, my Bible, as it were, was Richard Overden's book. Uh, this was first, the, your John Thompson book was first published in 1997. It remains the most authoritative book, uh, work on John Thompson. Today, Richard is Bodley's librarian at the University of Oxford. It is the top job in one of the top libraries in the world. And he has an incredibly busy schedule. He travels, you know, constantly. So I was really, really chuffed when Richard said, you always have a soft spot in your heart for John Thompson. And he agreed to come today to do this talk. And um, also, we're honored to introduce Hilary Thomas and her daughter Caroline, because Hilary is a great granddaughter of John Thompson. So she's come especially this evening. <laughs> so let's hand over to Richard. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Betty. Um, for that very generous introduction. And thank you all very much indeed for coming along this evening and giving me this opportunity to revisit one of my former research um, topics, um, this extraordinary man, John Thompson. And I'd like to um, apologize um, for having a crib sheet because it's been a long time since I um, looked in any depth at John Thompson. And when Betty asked me to come and give this talk, I was slightly nervous because it's been so long since I did the research. Um, uh, but it's been a wonderful opportunity to kind of revisit some of the things which um, I thought about at the time that I was doing the book and a, an exhibition that toured around the UK and Europe uh, at the time. Um, and I'd like to also pay tribute to Betty and Nerissa's wonderful show Across the Road, which I hope after this talk you'll gravitate just across to the Brunei Gallery to see their um, exhibition and to see Thompson's work um, in these extraordinary um, enlargements from Thompson's um, negatives, which um, are quite e e extraordinarily striking. Um, but I've got um, about 50 minutes where I'm going to share some re uh, reflections, really, on um, John Thompson's work. And um, I'm not quite sure... I hope that you can all hear me. Those of you who can't, Mark, if you could just raise your hand if I drift off, um, as, I, as I may well do. Um, but as Betty said, I um, had an extraordinary opportunity when I worked in Edinburgh, the town of John Thompson's birth. And I think we should also reflect that uh, today is John Thompson's birthday. So we should all, um, we should all sing him happy birthday at some point. Um, and um, Edinburgh was the town of John Thompson's birth, and um, I, as a curator in the National Library of Scotland with a great interest in the history of photography, um, discovered him and um, felt that Scotland, at least its National Library, ought to um, celebrate one of his, at that point, relatively unsung um, uh, 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 great innovators and great individuals, great characters, great artists, um, great pioneering photographer. And um, I found it stuck in my own copy of that book, um, the invitation to the exhibition opening back in 1997. And um, a huge amount of scholarship has happened both before, during and after I did my work. And I'd like to pay tribute to um, uh, this is just a, a snapshot of um, some of the books, uh, the ones just dedicated to Thompson. There have been many others, very erudite works, 
on the history of photography in China, written by some of the people in this audience. Um, Terry, Terry Bennett, I pay tribute to his um, extraordinary achievement in bringing together the history of um, uh, photography in China in the 19th century in particular. So, um, and Thompson is beginning to be recognized in China itself as being um, uh, a, a great photographer and his photographs are um, have been over the over recent decades become more appreciated and uh, and that's part in tribute to the Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine and in particular their library and William Schuchback its curator who first introduced me to the materials they have has done over the years a great service to photography and to John Thompson um, by allowing his photographs to travel and to be seen by broader and broader audiences. So my reflections are going to um, take a, a, a couple of um, approaches and the first is to reflect on Thompson's own uh, origins which were in the city of Edinburgh and Edinburgh in the 19th century was an incredible place it was a, f uh, a place of extraordinary ideas of intellectual energy it was not just a regional capital it was a capital of uh, a country which still has obviously very proud traditions of its own its own legal system its own educational ethos it had a great university, it still does in the city, now it has um, four universities. Um, and it was a place where John Thompson was born of relatively humble origins. His father was a tobacconist. I managed to find the census records and the details of, of his um, early life and his family. Um, but um, Edinburgh was, the pl was a place where it was possible to improve yourself and there were infrastructures in the city to allow for that self-improvement as there were in many other cities of Victorian, um, of, of 19th century uh, Britain. And he was fortunate to serve an apprenticeship to a scientific instrument maker. And in a city like Edinburgh where science was incredibly important, Edinburgh was um, the place where Charles Darwin went to study. Its medical school still retains um, an extraordinary reputation that it took from its Enlightenment um, heyday, which continued into the 19th century. So scientific instruments were made. There was a ready audience for those. There were very established um, practices. And Thompson was um, apprenticed to one of the best of those, a man called James Bryson. But at the same time doing that, he attended an evening, evening classes. And so he did, not, um, he did not go to Edinburgh University, but he went to the Edinburgh School of Arts or the Watt Institution, which was um, part of a movement called the Mechanics Institutes. And they allowed him to at, um, attend lessons in chemistry and English and other subjects in the evening and he was able to improve himself and get qualifications. He uh, obtained diplomas in those subjects, and um, he obviously recognized that he required um, an edu education. And one of the interesting things about Edinburgh at the time was that it played a crucial part in the history of photography, in the early history of photography in particular, and David Brewster, this um, individual, was at the heart of those movements. He corresponded with everybody who, um, in, certainly in Britain, who was important in the early history of photography. Um, and he was indeed the director of the Mechanics Institute, the Watt Institution and School of Arts that uh, Thompson attended. Um, so there's, there's somehow, and I think there's more work could be and should be done on these, some of these potential links between the scientific instrument trade, between the Watt Institution, which became Harriet Watt University, um, and individuals like David Brewster. And this, of course, is a portrait of Brewster taken by the great pioneers of photography in Edinburgh, um, David Octavius Hill and Robert Adamson. So, um, Thompson was born on the 14th of June, 1837, and um, 
by the early, the late 1850s and early 1860s, he had served his apprenticeship, he gained an education for himself, um, but like many Scots, he w could not be confined to the country of his birth. And there was, uh, Scotland was and still is a relatively small country, and the opportunities for self-improvement, self-economic improvement, were relatively small. And so like lots of Scots, he went abroad. And he went actually to follow his brother, who, uh, his brother William, who um, was also worked in the scientific instrument trade, um, but he went to Singapore. And Thompson, John followed his older brother to um, Singapore, where they um, can be seen in the uh, advertisements in the newspapers, in particular in the Straits Times, as um, chronometer, optical, and nautical instrument makers, the Thompson brothers. And, but Thompson is also listed separately in 1862 as a photographer um, open for business. So he must have learned the basics of photography before he went to Singapore, and that must have happened in Edinburgh. And it's not surprising because there was so much... Um, Edinburgh is so central to the early history of photography in these islands, and his connections with people like Brewster may well have played a part, but we don't know and need to know more. Um, but one of the interesting things, um, uh, and so this is just another example of um, Edinburgh in the time um, of Thompson's youth. This is another uh, photograph by Helen Adamson of um, the Scott Monument um, on Prince's Street. Uh, the subject of many early photographs, uh, some of them by William Henry Fox Talbot himself, who made uh, several pilgrimages to Edinburgh. He had family connections there, as well as scientific and intellectual ones. So Edinburgh is vital, vitally important, and there's, there's more to be told about this part of Thompson's life. Um, before we go any further into Thompson's um, life, I just thought I'd reflect partly on the archive, or indeed on the archives, because there is no single archive of Thompson's life. There's no document, single place where his documentary record can be told. So it has to be accumulated from a whole variety of sources, actually now spread across the world. Um, but there is this extraordinary photographic archive in the form of negatives, which are just up the road in the library of the Wellcome Institute for the History of Medicine. And there are these extraordinarily evocative um, crates um, lined with lead, which contain the glass plate negatives that traveled from um, China and from the East back to the UK with John Thompson. And they are extraordinary. Just kind of touching them is... Gave, when I first laid hands on them, there was a kind of electric charge. I felt this kind of, um, you know, like it must have felt like medieval pilgrims touching the knee bone of St. whoever. Um, that's what it felt like for me. And inside those crates are thousands of negatives, glass plate negatives with collodion emulsion, and um, these themselves have an extraordinary evocative nature to them. And you can see those in the prints next door in the Brunei Gallery. You can see the marks. The emulsion has flaked off. There have been scratches. They've been deliberately handled by Thompson in particular ways. And those marks, um, I became very excited at one point when you could see Thompson's thumbprint in the collodion as he would have dipped it in the bath to coat the plate um, uh, you know those thumbprints have uh, are, are still to be seen and here's the positive of the same um, uh, shot of of hong kong and you know there are many famous images of Thompson's work. This is perhaps the most famous. It appears on the cover of Stephen White's book. I'd like to pay tribute to that because that book um, really inspired me to do more work into Thompson. Um, the Island Pagoda, which appears as a most extraordinary carbon print in um, Fu Chow and the River Min, a book I'll come back to in a moment. 
Um, and it's one of the most powerful images in the history of photography, in my humble opinion. Um, but when you see the negative, you can see the interaction with the material culture of photography. The, neg the negative itself has been treated by Thompson and by the process, um, uh, the, 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 the process printers who made the prints that appear in that book. And that sort of, um, you can see the, the emulsion has, has um, uh, ha had suffered not only the passage of time, with the, uh, the, 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 the um, I'm struggling to find the word for the, uh, the, the crackling, um, but also the deliberate acts of um, masking out to, to um, originate the, the prints for the, um, for the publication. And then you also see these moments, this extraordinary um, print which appears in another of Thompson's books from the 19th century, Illustrations of China. Um, and in that book, there's this extraordinary account of Thompson setting up his tripod, taking the picture of this old bridge, and you can see the people viewing him who were really not actually very happy about the thought of being photographed. So they started to take bits of the bridge and throw it at him. And so he ducked behind the camera and the plate, which was in the back, cracked with the result of having been hit by one of these bricks from the bridge itself. Um, and here it is. Here's the, here's the negative with the crack in it, which, of course, has been removed by the, um, uh, the collotype printers. So you don't see that in the publication, but you can very clearly see it in the negative. And then the, the archive itself has been really well served by the Wellcome Trust. Um, then they're an institution with resource, as they say. Um, but they've spent that resource very well in making Thompson's entire archive available um, in a very open way. And so that's a wonderful thing for um, which I did not have at the time that I was doing my research. There was a typescript list, and I had to imagine what the prints looked like and go to the kind of tiny um, copy, uh, 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 tiny copy prints that they had to try and um, select images for the project that I that I did. So um, well done, well done, welcome. Um, and one of the things I wanted to reflect on, uh, and occasionally do in my own life, is the um, the benefits of indolence. And one of the benefits of indolence um, was in Singapore in Thompson's early life, where he arrived in Singapore at a time of an economic slump in the city. So his business did not do well. His brother's business did not do well. And he records finding himself with time on his hands. And one of the things that he did, he had access to, was a library. And I'm not quite sure which library it is. Again, there's more work to be done here, I think, in Singapore. But um, the 19th century was a world of print. And one of the things I want to leave you with is the importance of print culture on the history of photography and the interplay between the worlds of the book and the worlds of photography. And one of those aspects is Thompson um, bored in Singapore going into a library and reading a book. And that particular book is an English translation of a French traveler called Henri Mouot, who wrote a book called, which its English translation was called Travels in Siam, Cambodia, and Laos, a journeys that he made, Muo, in 1858 to 1861, and were published in London in translation in 1864, earlier in Paris. And that book was available for Thompson to read in Singapore in 1865. So it didn't take long for that book to get to Singapore. Bored Thompson reads it as, and sees one imagine it doesn't describe in detail that experience of reading, but the account is very evocative of Muo's travels into Cambodia to visit the ruins that we now call Angkor Wat. And there are these um, illustrations in the book, which um, you later see kind of reflected back in Thompson's own photography, and you can see those across the road. And then you see. Um, Thompson's own photographs of his trip to, um, 
to Cambodia. So he reads that book and he's inspired to go to Siam and Cambodia. And he goes first to Siam and he, um, he's able to take an extraordinary series of photographs. And he, you can just imagine, you know, the bored Thompson in Singapore in a, in a, you know, an English, a British colony suddenly going somewhere with a great deal more life and interest and new experiences and with his camera able to photograph um, scenes like the King's uh, Barge. And again, this interplay between print culture and the culture of photography um, is that you see that image then sent back to London and reproduced in wood engraved form in one of the most popular weeklies, the Illustrated London News. And so this is how many people experienced photography in the 19th century first, because it was cheaper. Um, until the technology caught up, it was easier to mass reproduce the photographic image translated by a skilled wood engraver. And these, these are two uh, Thompson images which were used, um, and you can see both of them across the road. Um, um, but you also see Thompson tropes through his own photography, his, um, his interest in different stratas of society. Um, here's a, a, a Siamese boatman. I don't know whether he was one of the boatmen on the, on the barge, but um, he likes to take um, photographs of diff people at different levels in society. And here is King Monkut, the, um, the king of Siam, um, dressed in his... Um, uh, uh, it's a French field marshal's um, costume, isn't it, um, that he was given by King Napoleon III. And, um, and as a, a, a symbol, perhaps, of the king wanting to portray his own sophistication, his own connection with the West. Um, but Thompson photographs him in other, um, other guises as well. And he is, of course, the, the, the figure that the king in The King and I, the musical, um, is based on, doesn't bear much resemblance to Yul Brynner, I think you'll agree, um, but an extraordinary, an extraordinary character in himself and a great figure in Thompson's own life because um, not only was he, um, I think he must have got on well with Thompson, he certainly sits for him a number of occasions, he gives him extraordinary access to the court to the other figures in the royal family who also sit for him. Um, and he gives him, importantly, a letter to take with him to Cambodia to give him access to the ruins of Angkor Wat. So Monkut is an extraordinary figure in um, the history of his own country and, his, uh, and, and of Asia in general. Um, but he's very important in Thompson's own career. And here is uh, another member, this time the Cambodian royal family. This is King Norodom. Um, and what he's able to do is travel to uh, Angkor. And this really makes his career. This visit, he's the first photographer just by a few days. There's a French photographer called Henri Gell who gets there literally just a few days after Thompson. But Thompson had got there first and takes an extraordinary series of images um, um, in Angkor. And he, he's able, I'll tell this story a little, a little bit later on, um, he's able to, to make his career, make his <laughs> reputation based on this visit. And the, rom the kind of romanticism of ruins is something which features prominently in English artistic life or British artistic life of the 19th century. Um, and it's played out again in a different location. But that same romanticism about decayed ruins and kind of lost civilizations. Um, but he's also, um, and to go back to my quote at the start, um, uh, a congenial and profitable occupation is that Thompson is a commercial photographer. So he's earning his living by photography. And in all of the places that he visits, he stops and makes prints that are sold at the time. So he's having to fund his own travels and his own 
um, imagine, you know, his, his own ambition as a photographer through commercial photography. And you see that often in more humble images, carte de visite. This is one um, taken in Vietnam on the, on the same trip, um, which were sold at the time. So he's able to kind of almost take a portable studio approach and set up um, for a limited periods of time, just perhaps days or weeks, and again, I think more work is needed on this aspect of, um, you know, the, the peripatetic studio, as it were. But I think one of Thompson's knacks um, is being at the right place at the right time. And luck plays such an important part in everyone's lives, but it certainly did in Thompson's. But it's also um, more than luck. I think he knew that Singapore was not a place to be based in its economic slump. It wasn't as vibrant, and he had somehow learned that Hong Kong was the place to be. And Hong Kong, its trajectory begins a little later as um, a British col colonial entrepot, um, but it, it takes off and becomes a very vibrant economic centre, as of course it still is today. And much of Thompson's most successful work is based in Hong Kong. That's where his, his, um, his studio is based and where his travels radiate out from. Um, and so after the, the South um, Asian trip, he goes back to the UK and then he goes out then in uh, 1868 um, and the China Mail in, on the 11th of March of that year announces that Mr. J. Thompson is prepared to take portraits, views and other photographs in his rooms on the commercial bank buildings Queen's Road. And again, so there's a commercial studio at the heart. He's selling prints to be sold. Um, he's having sitters come. But he's taking some of the work. And again, you'll see this very, very beautiful portrait um, blown up extremely large across the road. But it's very familiar. It appears in a number of Thompson's books. Um, and it's here in an album in the Bibliothèque Nationale, which is compiled by a French traveller to Hong Kong in the 1860s, 1870s. So he, he's selling these, these prints, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with these albums, which are gathered together from um, uh, studios and photographers on trips around the world or around particular regions. And here are some more of those. Um, and again, classic Thompson images which are radiate out of his out of his studio. Um, but he's there at a time where um, Hong Kong is on the up. And one of that, one of the reasons that we can see that is a visit of the Duke of Edinburgh in 1869 on board the HMS Galatea. And Hong Kong gets the bunting out in the style that only Hong Kong can do. And uh, they have an extraordinary celebration. And Thompson makes a book there in Hong Kong, which is published by a Hong Kong publisher, with his photographs pasted in. And um, there are s then several other books which are published of um, the region, which allows Thompson to establish another aspect of his commercial life in Hong Kong. Um, through the medium of the photographically illustrated book. So there are the individual prints which are being sold, but increasingly it's through the medium of the printed book, the publication, that his photography becomes um, disseminated. Uh, and he makes a series of journeys, and this becomes a, the great feature of his time spent in China, uh, a series of journeys um, in uh, between 1870 and, and uh, 1872. This one in 1870 up the north branch of the Pearl River. Um, um, this is actually back in Hong Kong um, in Happy, what, it, what, it, what is Happy Valley. <coughs> and then um, there are also experimentation. So here's a still life called The Fruits of China, which appears in one of um, his books. But I always draw the association with Roger Fenton. Um, so uh, Fenton takes, you know, there, there are familiar artistic tropes which, um, you know, did Thompson see Fenton 
and uh, is inspired to take that. Who knows? Um, I think one of the other aspects of this period in China is um, his ability, his personal charisma. And it comes across, it's quite difficult to um, unearth that from his writings, which are um, mostly quite Victorian in their style. They're quite relatively formal, lots and lots of detail, meticulous detail, but his character um, only kind of comes to the surface from time to time. And, but you see, you do see it in the photographs, and that's partly the way his own personality must have enabled the sitters to feel at ease or at least to um, pay attention to him, to give him this extraordinary access to um, very senior figures in the, um, the Chinese courts that he was able to photograph, and then very intimate scenes in Chinese life. You know, foot binding is, um, you know, there's a particular, again, a particular lens through which we must now interpret some of these photographs. But at the time, being able to be given the access to take photographs like this was um, uh, extraordinary, I think. And then also being given access to um, you know, private scenes, fairly intimate scenes in Chinese households, says something about his own uh, personal personality, his own charisma uh, as an individual. This is, um, Betty was asking me which is my favourite. Um, they change, but this, The Manchu Bride, is one of the most extraordinary photographs um, in um, the surviving oeuvre of Thompson, I think. Um, and there are a series of um, street scenes. Again, the different stratas of society. Thompson um, is concerned to photograph the whole of Chinese society and the whole of societies that he encountered. And again, very, they, they have a kind of, I think this one in particular has a kind of striking modernity about uh, about it in the, the way that some of the other images have, um, I'm sorry, going in the wrong direction, have um, kind of typical studio accoutrements to locate the sitter in their own culture. But this one, you know, could, is, is somewhat timeless and, uh, and placeless. And you can see in this one some of the um, fairly rudimentary studio arrangements that Thompson would, would have put up to take, to take some of these photographs. Um, so I'm going to, I'm conscious of the time, and I'm going to speed up at this point. I'm sorry to race through these. Um, towards the end of Thompson's, um, not towards the end of his career, but towards the end of this extraordinary period between 1868 and 1878, where Thompson makes these extraordinary photographic journeys in Asia and then comes back and makes a journey equally extraordinary within around the, the streets of London um, in another very groundbreaking series of photographs um, which we know as street life in London. And... Um, they have become as powerful as an inspiration to other photographers in the history of photography as his China work has, or his Asian work has. But what I want to come back to, and perhaps in the last kind of 20 minutes, or um, perhaps even less than that, is again to re-emphasize this connection between print culture and the culture of photography. So we often experience photography today in going to shows and seeing the photographs framed and hung on walls. And indeed, there were many exhibitions of this kind in the 19th century. But I think particular with photographers like John Thompson, the way that their work was shared and appreciated and understood was through the culture of print. And um, Thompson understood that, and I think that understanding made his reputation, his career, and his fortune. Well, I think fortune is perhaps overstating it, but it, it gave him 
uh, uh, a living. And we can see that both in his interaction with the magazines, which uh, reproduced uh, original photographs. Thank you to Terry for um, sharing this uh, uh, image with me. Um, we've already seen his interaction with the more popular press, the Illustrated London News and the Graphic, which um, didn't reproduce photographs as photographs, but photographs as wood engravings. And so they provided an income stream for him whilst he was undertaking these travels, um, the, the magazine work. And then through periods he's able to establish serious books which have a, literally a weight to them. They are serious publications, they're large format, they look like photographic albums, but they are publications which um, sold relatively expensively. Um, this is the first of his serious books. Um, um, in 1867, after he comes back from that first trip to uh, Southeast Asia from Singapore, and he recognizes that he's onto a winner. He's been the first one to get there. He's going to come back and he's going to make his reputation. He does that partly by offering himself as a lecturer to the learned societies of London, the London Ethno Ethnographic Society and the Royal Geographical Society. And you can see that he becomes a fellow of the Royal Geographical Society. So this is not bad for a tobacconist's son to come back, um, having failed to establish a business in Singapore, comes back as FRGS. Um, and he does that because he knows he's, he's got you know, an extraordinary um, a body of material. And he, again, I think this shows something about his charisma, is that he's able to interact with a number of um, serious scholars, one of whom is a great Orientalist and architectural historian called James Ferguson, who provided some of the text um, for this book. And um, Ferguson says in, in one of his own histories, the great, greatest amount of information could be obtained from the photography of Mr. J. Thompson and from his personal communications. From these sources, a tolerably connected account is condensed in my history of architecture. So, you know, Thompson is suddenly able to rub shoulders with serious scholars who have high reputation in London, and he gathers some of this reputation, this intellectual credit for himself through his own work, and it's published um, in, in, a, in this serious book with, you know, serious scholarship in it, as well as his photographs. And this, these get reviewed and establish his reputation and allow him to feel confident that he can make other books. And so then he goes um, back to Hong Kong, back to China, um, I think with the idea that he can make books, that he can make money out of making books if he can take the right photographs. And I'm sorry, you know, the, uh, the slideshow doesn't do justice to the experience of seeing these books you know, in the flesh, as it were. The, this is a big panorama, a joiner of several uh, individual photographs that have been pasted together uh, onto the book. An extraordinary, um, and again, one of the things that I don't have time to talk about in detail is the way that Thompson is interested in the, um, the technology of reproducing the photographic image in print. And he is part of that movement from seeing original photographs pasted in by hand into publications, a very time consuming and expensive process, with the latent um, problems with early well, 19th century photography, the fading of those prints, to using photomechanical means where ink permanence, permanent uh, printing processes can be used. Um, and you see that most in this extraordinary book called Illustrations of China and Its People, a visual en encyclopedia of China as seen by um, uh, this great photographer who comes back um, from um, the, this I intense period of, of um, six uh, journeys in China, comes back to London, and he upgrades his publisher from good old Edmondson and Douglas in Edinburgh to Sampson Low, Marston Searle in Rivington, one of the great publishers of the 19th, of 19th century London. And they do justice to this book in this 
to his work in this great book, four volumes, large format, um, printed by the Chiswick Press, one of the great printers um, of Victorian London, and with these most magnificent plates pr printed in this cutting-edge technology um, uh, called collotype. And collotype is an ink process, so the prints don't fade, but it allows for a better tonal range. Um, and um, they're printed on coated paper, so they have a kind of sheen to them. And uh, they reproduce his work I I extremely well. You can just kind of see um, these are large format books. They, they don't, they don't, the pages don't lie flat, so you can see the little of the, the buckling of the page. Um, and here's that image of the bridge, and you can see the collotype printer has managed to remove the crack in the negative. Um, and again, here's, you can see this image across the road. Um, these books are extraordinary. They're so beautiful, and they were... Um, they must have been an extraordinary experience in the 19th century to open one of these in a, you know, a gentleman's club or in one of the subscription libraries or to be able to afford to own one yourself. And um, when I first began, it became interested in Thompson, you could buy these books um, for £1,000 in, in the early 1990s, £1,500 perhaps, um, and the interest in, pho in photography in China, in Thompson, since then, means that this is a £70,000 book today. Mm -hmm. I want, I want, as William Blake once said. Um, and um, I'm just going to skip. And it, the, the, the collotype printers were able to print more than one image on a page with a single, um, in a single printing plate. Um, so there were lots of innovations um, that Thompson was clearly interested in, and you, you see that in the introductions. He talks about the improvements that these processes give, the experience of um, uh, appreciating his photography and his um, approach to the places he visited and documented. Um, I'm going to speed up. Um, and again, here you can see the kind of sheen that um, the collotype process has on these, this kind of coated paper. They're extremely difficult to make, actually. Um, but then Thompson again, and, I th and again, unfortunately, the Sampson Lowe archive was destroyed in the Blitz. So we don't have the publisher's archive, and there's so much that I want to know about the relationship between Thompson and his publisher. So. Pretty quickly after the success of Illustrations of China, and he gets fantastic reviews, and he quickly has to reprint, um, even for a very expensive book, he produces this cheaper version. So it's more than a cheaper version. It actually has the bulk of uh, the text written by Thompson, um, but it reproduces his photographs again in wood and gray form so that they can produce, reproduce a lot of images, and then it could be affordable to a broader audience. So his work... His thoughts about um, the places he's visited reach a much bigger audience. And Sampson Lowe had publishing relationships in other parts of the world. So you see a French translation, an Italian translation, and you see um, Harper's in America printing the book as well. So it's reaching a pretty huge audience. And again, they treat his, his images they give it a little bit of pizzazz by these little glassine tissues in front of the wood engraving. They're not necessary. There's no, not going to be any offsetting, but it's just to give a little theatricality, a little bit of deluxe flavor to them. And you can see, actually, the skill of the wood engraver, you know, the fine line to reproduce the tonal range of the photographs. So here's the collar type, and here's the same image in the wood engraved version in the Straits of Malacca. Um, if I had time, there's another, there's a whole lecture in this most extraordinary book, a very small illustrated, uh, uh, photographically illustrated book, a small run, but there are only 45 copies produced um, from one of the, the, the journeys that Thompson made up the Min River to Fuxiao. Um, his most magnificent book, of all, and um, 
it's really it's all uh, um, it's almost printed by subscription. I think he knew who the customers were. Um, we don't have the records, unfortunately, of exactly who they were. But um, from the surviving copies, there are only about five or six surviving copies. Um, we know that they were uh, largely merchants, particularly American merchants. Um, Fu Chao was uh, a trading capital, also it's one of the centers of the opium trade. But they are, they are truly magnificent. And I'd just like to finish um, on street life in London. So this again um, has in the photographs here, arguably, or they've certainly been described as the earliest street photography, the earliest um, social documentary photography. It was, a, it was a partnership between Thompson and a socialist journalist called Adolf Smith, and they worked together to really get under the skin of people who were suffering from the economic climate in London at the time and who they wanted to tell their story, to explain the hardships that they were suffering. And um, there's a bit of a dichotomy here because the subjects that they're treating are um, very humble people, many of them suffering from economic and social deprivation, but they're again using a very deluxe form of reproduction of the images. So this is called um, the Woodbury type, and the Woodbury types are designed to reproduce high works of art. So you see them reproducing great oil paintings of the period, um, Renaissance art is reproduced. These are very, it's a very expensive process, and the, the books normally illustrated by the Woodbury type are books which the elite are buying to educate themselves about art primarily, not exclusively, but primarily. So to see um, subjects of very humble citizens treated in this high art reproduction way is quite an interesting um, notion. And I ha I, again, it's the same publisher. We don't know exactly why they chose this method. It was relatively new and cutting edge at the time. Uh, but it does, it is this kind of idea of faithful reproduction. What you're seeing here is the best, the closest that you can get to the scenes that I'm photographing through this um, combination of technologies. And there's, you know, extraordinary detail. And again, it shows something of his personal charisma, getting um, close to the people that he's, he's photographing. Um, and it has a, a great impact, partly because of the text, because of Smith's text. Um, it's reviewed in all sorts of publications. Um, you know, MPs are talking about it. Um, it certainly has a, an extraordinary impact at the time. And other photographers have also been inspired by Thompson's work, um, street photographers. And um, one of the other interesting, and here's perhaps the most famous of these images, um, re reproduced in every history of photography, um, pretty much. Um, and that's how it appear, actually appears on the page of Street Life in London. Uh, very, very powerful uh, image. But one of the interesting things about them is that these, these were issued as parts. So a bit like Dickens' novels, which you you bought every week or every fortnight and then bound up at the end. This is how these works were disseminated. So relatively affordable, given the cost of the, the quality of the reproduction. But you, you, you gathered them together and it became a kind of a sequential story. And you can imagine Dickens, you know, with his kind of technique of ending each of those weekly parts with a cliffhanger. It's not quite the same, but you know you want to know more as you're as you're looking through them. And then, of course, the book um, actually the series don't sell that well, and so the publisher is left with overstock. And like all good publishers, they put a new title page on it and a new binding, and uh, reissue the unsold sheets. Um, this time is called Street Incidents a few, few years later to recoup some of their investment. And then finally, um, again, with the as the technology of reproducing the photographic image changes and improves, 
and with the, the market of um, literate people with disposable income to buy books grows through the 19th century. By the end of the century, you find this book reproduced using the halftone process, um, still you know, relatively high quality but cheap, cheaper than the other processes that we've seen, allows a much bigger print run and allows um, easier serialization of the book across different um, regions of the world. Here again, you can see Harper's um, playing a role. And one of the things that interests me is who, were read who was reading Thompson? Who was actually looking at Thompson? What, what difference uh, did access to these books make to people at the time and subsequently? And I think that's another field for study that um, is, is, is there um, in the books, on the libraries, on the shelves of libraries, um, public, institutional and private around the world. And I think there's something to be recovered about Thompson's um, impact both, both then and now. Um, and here he is. Happy birthday to you, John. Um, thank you for giving me such a wonderful um, opportunity to uh, explore new, new worlds that you had traveled before. Um, and thank you all very much indeed for listening. Um, I think there, are, there is some time, if anybody has any questions, I'd be very happy um, to answer any. Yes? I'm curious, how, how did the Wellcome Foundation come to have an archive which has, doesn't apparently have anything to do with medicine? Yeah, um, actually I meant to get back here, aren't I? This is being videoed, so... Um, so the question was, how did the Wellcome acquire the archive? Well, he um, decided to sell... Uh, the collection uh, towards the end of his life. Um, he didn't actually end up doing the deal. It was, it was done by, um, by the family after, after he had actually died. Um, but um, Sir Henry Wellcome left an extraordinary, you know, was a great collector himself, but left extraordinary resources to the library. And they had kind of omnivorous collecting um, ambitions and they had great resources through his um, farm, pharmaceutical, the income from his pharmaceutical empire. And so he was interested in his own field medicine, but he interpreted that very, very broadly. So anything that kind of vaguely fitted, um, they just had the money to hoover up. Would you, would you consider him to be the David Roberts of the 1870s? Because in the 80s, early Roberts, he much the same, all his <coughs> reproduced in books or whatever, and they were yeah. of course, of the yeah. So um, the question here was, was John Thompson the David Roberts of the later 19th century or the David Roberts of photography? I think there's, um, you know, there is a certain resonance with that. Um, uh, David Roberts, of course, in the Middle East in particular, another Scot who traveled, um, who traveled there and used the medium of the book as the principle but not the sole way of disseminating his own uh, artistic vision. I think the difference, um, I don't, I can't remember Roberts's work so well, but I think Thompson may have written more. Actually, there may be more um, of Thompson's own words to go along with the images than David Roberts. Yes? So was Albert Kahn later on in his Yes. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, the question was about um, Thompson's lecturing and Magic Lantern work, um, and actually Deborah Ireland from Deborah's here from the Royal Ge Geographical Society is doing a lot of work on this at the moment, which I think will be very interesting to hear more about. Thompson certainly did do a lot of lecturing, and that was you know it was very common to have uh, lecturers, and he did do Magic Lantern shows. Um, and they're just sort of part of that projecting a reputation, establishing a reputation. Um, and he certainly did it after he came back from Cambodia. And I think that was a, 
uh, one of the steps that enabled him to gain access to the Royal Geographical Society, the London Ethnological Society, and to start mixing with a different social circle than he had been used to in his own upbringing, in his own early life. And that gives him a certain credibility to actually then go and get a publisher. I don't know whether, you know, there was a recommendation from one of these people to Edmondson and Douglas. Maybe it's James Ferguson um, that gives them the confidence to uh, publish a book by this kind of, un, you know, relatively unknown person. And I, but he lectures all through his life. Uh, and one of the things that I didn't say at the end there is that... Um, you know, after all these great journeys, and the last one is to Cyprus, he established himself as a London society photographer in Bond Street and gets the royal warrant, photographs Queen Victoria, members of the royal family, and many other you know, people very much in the upper echelons of society. So I think um, you know, that, that sort of social and economic trajectory of him personally, I think the lecturing plays an, does play an important part um, in that, but my own view is that the books are what make, what really make the reputation and also give him the income. Right, oh, I'm sorry, two, two questions. Uh, yes, you uh, first. I missed this, but how was he actually able to communicate with the people of Cambodia, with the people of China? Did he speak the language or was, he, was it pure language? Because yeah, I, I, I don't know, uh, I can't remember, uh, uh, so I'm going to confess here, it's been so long, I've had some one detail that I cannot remember from, um, perhaps, Terry, do you? Oh, in China, he, he used interpreters. Yeah, he used to, but in, in, I, I don't know, in Cam, you know, the South, uh, Thailand and Cambodia had strong French influence, yeah. um, so whether Thompson knew any French or not, I don't, I don't know, perhaps there's someone in the room who knows. That's right, yes. And also King Alfred and the Prince who took him to meet um, yeah. him. Um, you know, they, they spoke English to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can your hand. Um, uh, two questions. Um, how long were the exposures? I know the Victorian glass plate photography very cumbersome, very laborious. Um, how long were the exposures? Um, can you talk about the efforts to um, uh, restore his grave? Um, I'm going to ask Betty to talk about Betty and Terry to talk about that in a moment. Um, you know, the exposure times vary on the lighting conditions. So that you, you know, they, it's all they, they it's all yeah. There's no artificial light. It's all natural light. And you know, photographers, um, you know, it's tripod photography. It's not handheld photography. Um, and uh, in Thompson's own lifetime, the, the processes improve so that you're able to take faster images, but they vary a lot depending on the particular conditions that you're, you're photographing in, um, how much natural light there is available to you. Yes. So, so just, just to add that the, just from the exhibition, the silent floor, you still see the neck holders? Right, and yes. Downstairs yes. China, you don't see. Yeah. So it's improved. Yes. Do you want to say something about the grave uh, restoration? I'll say at the end. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Great. It's not more than ten minutes. Because the downstairs, the thing you said is that the chemical they are sensitive or lost after ten minutes. Uh, you know, the photo, what he said, how long? So it depends on light, it depends on something. But the chemical, the chemist, the they seem they're not to last more than ten minutes. Yes. If the sensitive lost. Yeah, the sensitivity of the, of the, of the, the, co yeah, the collodion on yeah. the glass. Yes, yes. 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 But the, the actual effective by the heat. They're affected by the, the heat. The, the, the actual exposure times are much shorter than that, from a few seconds to a few minutes. It's not into connection with him. I'm sorry, yeah. Right. It's not into connection with Thompson and Isabella Burr. De Deborah, I'm going to. Here's the, the Isabella expert. He's in the room. Yes. Um, she taught. Uh, she was a pupil of his. He was. Right. And so he taught everything that uh, and introduced him to the world of photography. Yes. And uh, he's a very good teacher. Yes. And he was very good with Thompson. Yes. And he taught him how to do the photographs. Yes. And he taught him how to do the 
studied for three years before she took off to China. But before she went, she went to see him and took his advice and equipment. Okay, thank you. Miriam. So uh, uh, the, the question is how my own um, uh, encounter with the photography, uh, both when I did the book and now seeing the... So um, when I did the book, um, I did make new prints using, um, with, uh, uh, using 19th century techniques. So we, made, we were allowed to make copy negatives from the glass plate negatives in the welcome and we made new albumin prints whoops um which were sun printed gold toned using as much as we could recover from thompson's own techniques and these were the prints that were exhibited as as well as vintage thompson prints from uh, collections uh, around the world um, and so the exhibition across the road is um, modern enlargements, very, very large um, prints, which are, are made from digital scans in the welcome. And I think the thing that most strikes you about that, strikes me about that, is that um, you see just how much data the collodion process captures. So that it's, you know, we think today of digital imaging as being, you know, extraordinarily high resolution. But collod the collodion process actually captured an immense amount of detail. And it can bear being blown up to enormous scale without losing uh, resolution, without losing definition. And so there's a lot of um, information that you can gather by seeing them in, in such a, a large scale. But it, they're very much, it's a very different experience to the one that you would have experienced seeing the print, you know, the prints were all, co you know, uh, copy prints. So they're contact prints made from the negatives and they're the ones which were bought by the travellers in Hong Kong in the 1860s and 70s and stuck into those albums. Um, so it's, it's a very different experience, but you get something completely different from it, as you do from uh, the, the, the Welcome's website and looking at the digital images through um, on, on your screen. Um, perhaps a last question. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, there's no instant photography, so he's not printing the images on the spot. There's no Polaroid aspect to this, so he would have had to have, to do that, he would have to be able to go back and find the people again once he's gone back to somewhere where he can make the prints. Yeah, there's a particular picture in the exhibition of a boat woman, they say, yeah. great images. Yeah. And you can see that he's re she has really posed yeah. for him. Yeah. 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 I don't. I don't remember any Thompson writing about doing that. Um, it would be. It would be wonderful to find them if they survive. Um, I think at this point I'm going to hand over to to Betty. Well, Richard, thank you very very much tonight because. This is like the most comprehensive talk we've had and, and also I think the time you spent preparing, you know, putting the images together filled in a lot that's not in the exhibition and, and so we know much, much more. And uh, certainly myself, Marissa, and I'm sure everyone here, I feel this is the highlight of our three months exhibition here in London. So thank, thank you again. And, um, 
and Thompson's birthday to because you picked that date. <laughs> There's only one one day. Um, anyway, I just want to take this opportunity to also thank the um, exhibition supporters in King Power and also the Buffini uh, Chow Foundation, who's, who's helped us to put the show together. And the um, Restoring the Grave, this is really, I think, a, a, a sort of cold call email we got from um, friends of uh, Terry Bennett here. Terry actually was the person who found the grave in the Streatham Cemetery in Tuting. Uh, it was quite difficult to find because the stone has uh, keeled over. Uh, Terry's taking some photos. And really, you know, with this London exhibition opening and all the people seeing the show, it was just the effort that we feel was the least we could do is to restore the brain. And so, very quickly, so we set up this Just Giving link, and it's three parts the, the sum of the link, the amount is to restore the stone. We're actually quite some way towards that already. If we had more uh, support, we can perhaps do a rededication ceremony or maybe a little memorial book. But it's step by step. But certainly, I think just restoring the, the stone physically would be a, a wonderful thing to do. And also, well, the exhibition is, is closing, as I say, on the 23rd. And, and it would be a lovely a legacy to sort of connect uh, the, the, the world of people who are sort of interested in um, Thompson. So we can keep you posted to say oh, what's happened next because the street life, we're going to have a small case in the Museum of London um, um, exhibition this autumn. And then the exhibition will travel on to um, Bournemouth, to Leicester and other places. Um, so anyway, what, what we'd like to do is to invite you all to come with us back to the gallery uh, certainly Nervous and I, and, and I think for a little time to be there, we can answer questions. Uh, and to also thank again for Hilary and Caroline to be here this evening. Who? Oh, oh, yeah. Did you have a hand or oh, question, Hilary? Well, it's to, uh, well, to, to Richard. I wasn't the father Um, so, uh, Hillary's question was about the status of Thompson's father, um, and um, my uh, certainly in the census records he's described as a tobacconist, and I think I found him in one of the street directories, one of the commercial directories as a tobacconist. So, I, th I think it does, but um, I think, um, you know, Thompson, um, his, two of his siblings were sent to a school, um, but Thompson himself is not um, registered at the same school. I went through all the archives and couldn't find him in any of the school registers. He appears as an apprentice to a scientific instrument maker and then he's not, he's not of a class that, sends, that sent their children to the university. So he, he's educated in, in a night school. So I think that says something about um, the social status of his family, um, which are aspirant, very much aspirant. Um. So I just wanted to also introduce you to Andrew, Andrew Cho, who's our PhD student who's studying, doing her research on John Thompson. So hopefully all, you know, everybody's work will come together. Yeah. That's what we'd like to do is maybe try and pull the resources. Absolutely. And, and yeah. Bring it together. Yeah. Good. Well, we should go and see the book, uh, the, yeah, the, the, the show. <laughs>